You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. This week we are talking about kissing, we're talking about smiling and going reptile. And you're probably wondering what that is all about. Uh, I will get into a full explanation and by the end of this podcast you will be going reptile yourself and realizing the benefits of it. Um, before I get on to introducing today's guest and the interview, I just wanted to say if you haven't been to anxietypodcast.com, you can go there. I've been adding stuff so now you can go to the free tab and you can get a copy of my Lean In Audio, which is an audio to help you stop panic attacks. Um, you can also get a copy of the ebook and access to the workshop. You'll get all of that stuff once you put your email address in there. It gets sent out to you straight away. Um, you can also, if you're interested in one-on-one coaching, you can check that out at the same time. And obviously there is my five-week course, which you can get access to by checking out the online course page. Okay, so today's guest, Andrew Hutchinson, uh, essentially struggled with anxiety a lot himself. Um, both mentally and physically, it kind of manifested in ways which caused him a lot of unpleasantness and a lot of pain. And he kind of went on a bit of a, a one-man mission to fix himself, to heal himself, and read a lot of books, tried a lot of traditional approaches that didn't work, and eventually stumbled across some things which made a massive difference for him. Um, and I was introduced to him through a mutual friend, and he was kind enough to come on the podcast and share some of these techniques which just make uh, a difference. And they're things which I've been implementing since our conversation and uh, I've found to be particularly useful. So without further ado, let's introduce Andrew and we can get into the conversation. Here we go. Okay, so Andrew Hutchinson, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thanks, Tim. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And we were introduced through a mutual friend who uh, spoke very highly of you. So I'm excited to to kind of get into this discussion today. Um, One of the things that we usually start out with um, is to talk about people's background and kind of how they got to where they are today, how they got to doing what they're doing. And I know you have you have quite a story. So I wonder if you'd be kind enough to start off with kind of going through some of that. Yeah, um, please stop me if I start uh, waffling too much. Um, I'll try and keep it as concise as possible. Go for it. I I suppose uh, in the in the more recent times, you know, you can, I'm sure you can attribute lots of stuff that happened earlier in life, but effectively, I I had spent a fair amount of time reading negative media, um, had kind of become aware of how bad the big bad world was out there and things that were happening. And yeah, spent too much time doing that. And then we, my wife and I had our first child and I I can't say all of a sudden, but I can only guess from what I understand in terms of how these behavioral patterns, these thought patterns start, that that was a trigger Mm -hmm. for me worrying because I, somebody who'd never really worried before, I'd never considered myself a worrier, you know, like anyone, we have anxious moments, but, um, yeah, I, I worried in an unhealthy way about everything to do with with Reese, his health, uh, things that could hurt him, particularly germs. Um, you know, I, I developed obsessive behaviours regarding washing my hands. You know, knuckles got so bad that they started bleeding, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and as I understand it, these behavioural patterns, you know, it starts to spread to other areas of life. You start worrying about food preparation and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, um, it, it, it became, I didn't realize at the time, I'll be honest, that it, that it had reached the levels it had. It was only when I had some small muscular pains in my feet. Um, and they were, they were really more to do with that, just exercise some stuff that I'd been trying at the time running. I was working on a few things. Um, and they were just aches and pains. And because of the place I was in, I started to protect them and uh, did a thing which is known as muscle guarding, which is effectively, you know, it's the curl up response in the fight, flight or curl up in a ball mechanism. Mm -hmm. Draw my body in, in this kind of tight protective ball to protect my, my muscles of my feet from getting worse, from being hurt. And 
this eventually led to um, quite severe impingement of the femoral arteries um, with the psoas constantly pulling in all the muscles around it. Um, the hip muscles got so tight, they impinged the femoral arteries and kind of restricted blood flow to my lower legs and feet um, to the point that my toenails started to blacken. Um, none of them actually fell off, but they were getting pretty close. Did that stop you like standing up straight if your hips were that tight? Um, no, but I couldn't walk very well. Yeah. Um, I couldn't walk more than, um, no, they, they still moved, but it was, um, it was like a deep, what, one of the therapists described it to me, one of the manual therapists I saw is when people go in to see him, they normally have maybe two layers of an onion or three layers of an onion if they're really bad. Right. Um, I had about 16 or 17 was the only way he could put it. Right. So you had a big onion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's, there was this level of tension that had just um, built and built and built. So mm. you know, you, you literally, if you if you touched an area of my body where you were looking for muscular tone, you wouldn't feel anything because it was, it wasn't like the wooden feeling of touching a, a hardly trained athlete. But it was, um, yeah, it wasn't very, wasn't very nice. Mm. And yeah, there was just a huge amount of, of tension that had built up because when you develop muscular guarding, it's not just those anxiety triggers when you, you know, say, for example, the OCD, when you go to wash your hands, that doesn't exist most of the day. It's only when you go to do it that the trigger is initiated, if mm. you like. Yeah. When you're, when you're moving around, you're on your feet all day and your feet are freezing cold because there's, there's no blood there. You're, you're conscious of that all the time. Yeah. So it progressed very, very quickly um, and ended up with me yeah, not, not being very well. Um, so that, that pretty much sums that up, you know, because from there it's, it's, um, it's a journey back to back to wellness, which I can I can happily start there. But I've talked quite a lot, so it's probably best to let you talk because I'm I'm not the best at that. Yeah, I was going to say um, the what was the amount of time from starting to feel the the kind of pain in your legs to you know to it progressing? Was it fairly rapid? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say no no more than three or four months max, probably more like one or two months. Mm. Um, but obviously this had been building for a while yeah I know. and I just didn't realize it that you know all this all this stuff that you're putting into your brain all this negativity creates a negative perception of the world you know um, and did you I, and did you feel like uh did you understand that it was kind of connected the mental and physical piece at first I was I, I didn't really know. No, I, I would say I thought it was more physical because coming from um, a very physical background, I suppose, a lot of sporting history. Um, I was a personal trainer many, many years ago um, for a short period of time back in my kind of uh, late teens, early 20s. Mm -hmm. And I'd always been fascinated with, with the sport side, the movement side, the performance side. And I'd never really um, looked into psychology or you know anything around anxiety because i'd never had the need to mm. and i i approached it from a i need physical therapy you know my muscles are tight i need them working on yeah. um i believe but I, I i went to the to the doctor to to kind of see and that was you know your typical you know you have plantar fasciitis you know take these tablets um so yeah, anyway, so I then went forth to physical therapy. I tried a number of different manual therapies, um, you know, from ART, various types of myofascial release, neurokinetic therapy, um, all with the idea in, in them that, you know, you release muscular tension in one way or another. Mm. Uh, I won't go into, you know, all the study I did on that and why certain things work and why certain things don't, um, but it didn't work for me. And... I then tried a certain amount of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, admittedly on my own from reading, yeah. uh, because at that point I had very little money left to to pay for treatment. So I tried that, and I think I, I gave it a good run. Um, and, and I felt that it may have had a certain amount of benefit, um, yeah. but I was, still, I was still in a bad way. And so I continued kind of looking around, but still, I think, yeah, I mean, my, my focus was definitely shifting from the physical to the mental, obviously, as, as is shown by the fact that I'd, I'd looked into that. I'd started buying books on anxiety. Mm. 
um, reading about anxiety. And most of the approaches, again, didn't work for me because they were too thought-based. Um, and that's not to say that all of them are, but the ones that I came across, the ones that were recommended, were all thinking your way out of this. Mm. And as I've discovered, I don't think that's the way. Um, I think that just makes things worse because we're, you know, we're thinking that's part of the problem. Um, we, we need to rest that that part of the brain. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd continued study practice. Um, started to to do some relaxation techniques that I remember from yoga years ago that I'd done, melting bits of the body by focusing parts of the body and imagining them melting just to physically relax. Mm. And I started to notice that that was that was having some positive effects. And it was about the time that I was doing those, maybe a couple of months in, I can't remember, that I came across TRE, um, trauma release exercises or tension release exercises. Um, David Bocelli's work, working with disaster survivors and PTSD. And it was expanding into the world of kind of, you know, people that hadn't had those really traumatic events, but general everyday stress and tension and anxiety. Yeah. And I read the book and it was like, wow, this is amazing. So, you know, the body has this innate healing mechanism, you know, to kind of effectively shake out tension, trauma, all the emotional baggage that we have is stored within our cells. You know, it sounds very esoteric, but if that's the right word, but it, it's effectively stored in there and we can, we can release it from this biointelligent organ or, you know, muscle, the psoas, which is directly connected via the center of the spinal cord to the reptilian brain. So it stores a lot of this. And I put the book down, I remember, and I went down and I said, I'll, I'll try those later. And I lay down and I, I went through my process of relaxing the body. And I started to have these violent tremors um, in my kind of midriff area, which would be around about the center of the psoas. You know, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it connects to five vertebrae in the spine, goes down through the pelvis and hooks onto the hips. It's the fight or flight muscle. It initiates movement. It initiates that curl up response, so on and so forth. And these tremors continued for some time and I then day after day did them and and noticed that it was having a really positive effect very, very quickly. And these layers of tension were, were peeling away and I was having these experiences that I can only describe as seeing things that I hadn't even thought of Mm. having flashes, like a memory of something at school or whatever. And it was, if it was just like a quick vision and then it went. And And what were you doing to initiate this, this uh, practice every time? Like, were you, doing some specific exercise to get into it? I, I wasn't having to do any specific exercise. All I was doing was lying on my side, which at my time was the preferred position. Mm-hmm. Um, um, TRE has a lot of people on their back with their knees bent because it shortens the side, so it replaces it in a relaxed position. But I found that almost like a recovery position on my side because it, it allowed me at the time to effectively imagine, if you imagine the shoulder that's up, not the shoulder you're lying on, is melting into the other one. And you can use this melting that side of the body, melting that hip into the other one. So your body's kind of falling together, squashing together, just melting like a big wet lump. Um, and then bringing my awareness to that area below the navel that's, you know, referred to as the Dantian in Qigong. And it's it's kind of in the realm of the center of the psoas as well. Yeah. So imagining that area kind of softening, if you like, you know, mm-hmm. in yoga they talk about bringing an awareness um, so you're not focusing or trying to affect change. You're merely taking your awareness there. And in the same way that a lot of energy healers will talk about um, energy follows thought. If, if you don't try and affect change there, you tend to find that energy just goes there and does what it needs to do. You are effectively allowing the body to heal. Mm. You're placing it in a place of rest in the same way that good meditation does. It turns off the prefrontal cortex for want of a, a, a better description um, and it rests that part of the brain and it allows you to, to go into the part of the brain that needs to heal. It rests the brain in such a way that the brain can then heal and process stuff that it needs to process. And, and this is effectively what was going on in the psoas. Um, it was shaking this, this trauma out. And, and day after day after day, I did this morning and, and evening when I was lying in bed at night or just before I got up in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, often going to another bed to do it because as much as my wife loves me, um, having somebody shaking in the bed doing this next to you is not the most fun when you're trying to wake up, you know, in a nice, yeah. uh, smooth kind of manner. So, yeah, and it, 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 
it changed my life in many ways because it, it it turned it turned that process around and I I started to get considerably better and I may have returned to full health with just that uh, I honestly don't know um, but I continued my study because I was absolutely fascinated by what this had done and because I'd been led in via the psoas if you like this this part of the nervous system in some ways because it's so heavily connected to the vagus nerve um, and the gut. And I kind of learned my way upwards through the nervous system, if you like. So through the vagus nerve, learning all about the vagus nerve and how it connected to all the organs and it sends messages to and from them to the brain and so on and so forth, acting like a caretaker almost in the body um, and how important its health is. And through through other things I was reading, I can't pinpoint anything in particular, and, and through practice, probably more through practice at that point even, um, not just in the really latter stages. I I started playing around with, with breath and noticing sensations in the face um, when I was breathing and wondering what was really going on there. And I started to study the, the, the nerves of the face um, to a degree. I mean, you know, obviously I, I'm no expert, but... The, the trigeminal nerve, for exa- example, is, is like a spinal cord in our head, um, and it sends the messages that the face sends, the muscles and the nerves of the face send, to the limbic system and the endocrine system, where our, our mood and behavior regulating chemicals are secreted. Mm-hmm. Not all produced there, but most of them are secreted there. And, you know, there's, there's loads of other brain science that that's connected to, but, it, you know, it starts to get very complicated, too complicated for, for me and, and for people that are far more knowledgeable than me. Um, but we do know that, that mood-enhancing chemicals, um, you know, such as melatonin, serotonin, DMT, which we use in dreams to process stuff at night, um, they're released there, they're secreted there. And, yeah, I won't go too much on that now because I was leading through to the face and... And effectively, that we can change the way that we stimulate them by the way we move our face. And this became evident to me through studies that were done with smiling and kissing. For example, when you smile, you release a cocktail of these chemicals. And when you kiss, the, you, you release a cocktail of these chemicals. Most, most of the chemicals release very similar but in different combinations, oxytocin combined with melatonin in different ways and so on and so forth. And even if you're not feeling great, if you, again, language here, if you use the word play, for example, and smile at the same time, mm-hmm. because of the sensations of that word, you tend to form a very genuine smile, which includes the small muscles of the eye. The small muscles of the eye are strongly connected to the limbic system. And so we can actually affect our mood and our behavior by simply moving the muscles of our face because they are sending a message via the way they're stimulating these nerves in the face. So I started playing around a bit with smiling and kissing and I got pulled very strongly towards the kiss for quite a long time. And it would seem there's a small amount of evidence regarding this, but it's not been thoroughly researched to be quite honest with you. I can only go on my experience with this and others that have had the same experience. Yeah. When you form a kiss, particularly at the start of a kiss, you can make yourself very drowsy very, very quickly. Um, there's a place where you can, you can kind of send yourself almost to sleep within about two minutes. So I can only assume, and others that I've spoken to with far more experience in uh, neurochemistry than me, who are kind of still working in this area, that that's very melatonin heavy um, because that's, that's the chemical that, that helps us go to sleep. So... Effectively, by playing around with this, we can we can short term affect our chemistry, and and that was very interesting to me because when I then start to look into mood and behaviour and perception, when you look at, for example, people that are treated for depression with melatonin and serotonin reuptake inhibitors, funnily enough, these same chemicals, it changes their perception of the world, so they're able to function. Mm-hmm. And we won't go into the long-term effects of, you know, using synthesized versions of these chemicals and the fact that you usually have to then take other chemicals to combat the side effects. Um, but it enables them to function very, very quickly and, and go back into society or work or whatever the problem is, you know. 
Um, so if we change our chemistry, we can change our perception on the world. And yeah, that, that's kind of a powerful thing. And anyway, long story short, that then leads me on to, well, okay, this is all very well short term, yeah. but then how do we affect this long term? Because a lot of us are carrying a huge amount of tension in our face. You, you only have to look at the studies by the Sound Academy into tongue tightness and um, the amount of people that are suffering with TMJ, the temporary mandibular jaw syndrome, I think it is the tightness in the in the jaw. Mm. A lot of people I speak to... Um, funnily I actually, enough, I was going to say, actually, that... that... You, you, the TMJ thing made me think of like when I was uh, having particularly bad panic attacks. I got locked jaw fairly frequently where I couldn't even open my mouth. So is that is that related? Yeah, all interconnected. Um, so when you're because we're in this constant state of we could call it arousal or pre arousal that we're we've so much going on all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look at the brain mapping studies, for example, that were done when somebody looks at a picture of a tree on a computer screen versus when they look at a picture of a crowd of people or um, a dog that's chained to a fence emaciated mm -hmm. and see the way the brain reacts. What, you know, and not, not just sad pictures, but anything that you might respond to. And it's kind of, this is not my expert area. I know, no, only know what I've read that these guys talk about as holding a lot of facial tension. It affects where the tongue sits. Um, in particular, the the tongue, the tip of the tongue, when we're not talking or you know breathing through our mouth, which we shouldn't really do anyway. Most of the time, we should have our mouths closed in a relaxed fashion. The tip of the tongue forms effectively an earthing point for the two main energy channels of the body. Um, this is widely known about in craniosacral therapy, which um, the gentleman who recommended me to you, a wonderful guy, works in. Um, so they understand the power of this, as do yogis and, and many people do. It's also the central branch of the trigeminal nerve, that main nerve that we talked about. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important place in this. But also, more importantly overall, is the fact that when you're carrying tension in your face, you are sending a message via those nerves to your mood and behavior chemicals, to the rest of your body through your nervous system, of tension. Um, whether that's because your upper jawbone is, is tight and the muscles there are tight um, and they're pulling that part of the jaw away from where the tongue should sit, whether it's because the tongue's tight. It's not all about the tongue sitting there, but if you imagine this, this, this tension is sending a message of tension. It's, it's your perception of the world is tense. So in the same way that we can smile and think fun, even when we might not be having the best day and it flushes us with this positive feeling, even when we might not necessarily be feeling negative, our face is sending a very different message mm. because of this tension. And you don't have to look super tense you know you don't have to have your face all scrunched up these are small muscles that have a huge effect and day after day after day that you know it causes a change in your perception because it's affecting your chemical balance um and obviously we know there are so many tools that we can step in and start to reverse this but if we can actually get in at the point here where we take in so much of our information and we can have an impact here well that's wonderful so if when we take, sorry if I've scooted over anything there, I may well have done, but if, if we take the smiling and the kissing a step further and we utilize it as an exercise um, whereby we kind of fatigue the muscles, you won't even feel the fatigue coming on necessarily, but in the same way that TRE fatigues the psoas to a point where when you lie down, it's so relaxed that it starts to release all this stuff. Now, admittedly, I took a different approach to that, but, yeah. but we got there, we got to the same point. We do this with the face. And, you know, it's not for me to tell anyone what will happen with their face when they start doing this, but every single person that's done this is yawning as if they've got a flip-top head, you know, with the, as these releases in the big jaw muscles um, start to effectively shake out like these tremors. When you do the kiss, a lot of people are finding great benefit from the kiss. You, you know, play with it. Use it as an exercise. Um, again, I keep saying play because that's so important to have that approach. Because you're not trying to affect change. And when you don't try and affect change, change comes. Um, you're allowing the body to do what it does best by just playing. When people do the kiss, um, they have a, tend, tend to have a lot of releases in the tongue and in the upper jaw. And it can make this weird grunting noise as the roof of your mouth kind of shakes this tremor out. 
So, yeah, essentially what we're trying to do with that is to release this tension that's accumulated over who knows how long. Mm. Um, you know, other effect, there are other factors that can, that can affect this, you know, things that happen in childhood, obviously, um, prenatal even, um, not breastfeeding, so on and so forth. It forms a certain structure in, in the jaw and the muscles. So, but that, they don't matter to us. What we need to do right now, they do matter, <laughs> but right now what we're trying to do is, is help. And if Move we can... Forward, yeah. Sorry, what was that, Tim? No, I was going to say moving forward. I, I, I inter- I'm interested to know if um, if uh, I've, I've been. We talked a little bit about this on the show before, and uh, a book called "Waking the Tiger" by Peter Levine, um, which is somatic experiencing. But it sounds familiar, like a lot of the, um, you know, energy trapped in the nervous system, which isn't fully expressed, becomes tension, becomes you know, anxiety or depression or stress for a lot of people. Um, is that is that something you've come across? I've never read that book, but yes, all of these things are based in the same view of the body, the way I, the way I see it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there, there are experts. Sorry. Go yeah, I was going to say it's interesting. I'll send you a, I'll send you a link to, to check that book out. But, yeah, we had – we talked a bit about that type of thing before and uh, – he goes into quite a lot of detail about, you know, the the croc brain and, you know, how we're kind of designed to just respond and humans are one of the few mammals that start getting into, you know, the getting stuck basically in or not having the ability to fully express trauma or fully express emotion. Um and as you just it just you just made me think of it because you talked about, you know, pre you know, childhood or baby or infant stuff. He talks about children that, that may have a high fever is something which even gets the nervous system to, to have some PTSD type, uh, expression. So anyway, just, uh, just something that came to mind. No, absolutely. I mean, it is, this is, this is, this is all, um, all kind of one in the same thing in many ways that, mm-hmm. uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I thought of something else, but uh, it's gone now, but yeah, it's, this 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 energy um, energy trapped trauma. Um, yeah. But, uh, what, that that was it. One of the reasons we 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 struggle. I mean, well, there's, there's two there's two things that come to mind. Firstly, our brain, particularly the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, is a fairly recent thing. Um. But no matter how recent, the fact is, if you look at how much our lives have changed, even in the last fifty to hundred years. The brain's had nowhere near enough time to to evolve to cope with that, so that's one we, reason why we really struggle. Yeah. And um, also because of a lot of what we accumulate, we we have this mechanism. If you if you, for example, watch a gazelle escape from a cheetah on a nature documentary, what you'll see when it's escaped, providing it doesn't get caught, um, is that once it's definitely got away and it realizes I've escaped here, there's a quiver mm. as it shakes. Its entire body shakes. That's a neurogenic tremor. That's a release of that fight or flight, that cortisol, everything, the adrenaline that just kicked in to save its life. Yeah. It's a release of that. The stuff with us is accruing bit by bit, day by day. You still have the ability, if you were in an extremely fearful event, to shake. Um, but, yeah, we have kind of lost it to a large extent, and it's also because the stuff we're accumulating day by day, and that's why you know, depression, anxiety, they don't come about overnight. It's 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 a it's a process. Yeah, cumulative effect, and I would say um, that, and something I've probably said before is that society tells us to kind of uh, suppress those um, types of behaviors as well, like the the, the thought of somebody shaking um, or rocking um, or trying to you know get that out of the the system is you know often we're told to calm down, relax, don't worry about it, don't cry like all of those natural mechanisms we have to show emotion are so often stifled by, you know, people saying everything's all right. Um, whereas animals just do their thing and get it out. Right. Yeah. You've, you've hit the nail on the head. You know, I mean, society is another big part of it. Just man up or oh, relax, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We, we've, we've become conditioned. Not, so, not, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, let's get back to the kissing part. So just so that we can like, distill it down as a practical tool for the listener to use. Uh, um, yeah. Are we talking about actually kissing somebody else or just making a kissing motion? Can you just be very specific about what that exercise looks like? 
Absolutely. Um, if you want to go and kiss somebody, um, by all means, kiss them in the centre of the forehead because that also, also activates the pineal gland, um, which is something we haven't even discussed. Um, that's a big part of this. But um, we are effectively going to think play, first of all. So think play. Get yourself in that mindset. This is a game. This is fun. Right. And then we are going to smile as we breathe in. And we don't really need to force that smile. And if that smile feels fake, that's fine to start with. It'll probably feel more genuine straight away because you think play. And then you will smile. And then you will you will go into the smile and you'll breathe in. And when you want to breathe out, you will breathe out. If your mouth wants to stay in a smile, let it stay there. It'll work its way out. Then you'll bring it into a kiss as you breathe out, ideally. You can, you, can, you can force this. You can go into the smile and breathe in. And even if it wants to stay there in a smile, you can force it to go back out into a kiss as you breathe out. And by a kiss, yes, I mean forming a pucker as if you were about to, you know, give somebody a big smack. And like, Mwah. Right. Um, and, and make noise like kiss? No. no you don't have we, to make the noise? We, we don't want to do that at all because that involves taking breath in or exhaling breath, expe- exhaling breath from our mouth. Got it. We are keeping our mouth closed at all times. There's a reason why as humans we're supposed to breathe through our nose most of the time. It's better for us. Lots I won't go into that. Yeah. If anybody wants to watch Paul Check talk for two and a half hours on why you don't mouth breathe, they're, uh, they're welcome. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, stick to keeping your mouth closed. Um, so you are forming a smile and then you are going down to the other. You're basically drawing your jaw back into a smile. So you're going to one end of the motion and then you're going all the way into a pucker as you breathe out through your nose. Always breathing through your nose. So, I mean, I don't know if you can hear me, but if you were to go, you can do that. You can do it really softly. It it doesn't really matter, to be honest. We've we've tried this a whole number of ways me and people have been working with. Um, And whether you go soft and it slowly increases, it it doesn't really matter. Um, And the the cadence is just based on your breathing. So I'm... Yeah. I'm, in, I'm inhaling, I'm smiling, I'm thinking about play. And then as I exhale, I'm exhaling through my nose, my lips are puckered out and I'm still smiling, um, actually. Um, but that's the, that's the kind of pace we're looking for. And, and how long do you do this for to get a result? Um, give it five minutes, morning and evening, um, whenever you feel like doing it. Again, right. this, is, this is not something I like to be strict with simply because – it's something that then people can beat themselves up for not doing and, mm. and, and don't want that. It, uh, you know, a big part of this is in the approach. But yes, consistency will obviously get you to a good place quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I'd encourage people to try different ways. You know, try doing a deep smile as you breathe in and doing the deep kiss as you breathe out. Try it more forcefully. Try it softly. Um, they will all have a positive effect. Yeah, I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit in the car and do this at the traffic lights, and people are gonna be like, "What is that guy doing?" <laughs> <laughs> well, for sitting in the traffic lights, just bring your awareness to the roof of your mouth. That'll that'll work magic. But um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, do, yeah. Do it. Do it wherever. Um, so let's just recap the the physiological piece behind the smile and the kiss. Like, what's happening inside when we're doing that? Okay, um, you have. Two glands in particular, there are a number of glands in the endocrine system, but you have the pituitary gland and the pineal gland. And the pineal gland was my first area of focus because that's the one that secretes melatonin, serotonin, and DMT. Um, DMT being the spirit molecule, the thing we use for dreaming and helps with the creativity and right. so on. So we can naturally produce the chemicals that we need. Yeah, we're, we're, we're producing those. The, the, the big thing is here, in, in studies that have been done in the West – in inverted commas, the pineal gland is shown to have atrophied in nearly all subjects between the ages of 17 and 20. Now, we can go into all the reasons behind that, the educational system, um, fluoride in water and in toothpaste, which is believed to calcify it. There are a whole host of reasons. But in studies that were done in, for want of a better word again, simpler societies where they don't have the lifestyles we have, the pineal gland is shown to be healthy into the 50s and 60s. This is the gland that secretes these chemicals that are so important for our health. Um, you know, the, the, the applications right now range very, very far. There's a lot of guys that are serious in their fields working with you know, MS and cancer with melatonin. So it's, the potential there is huge. Not for this method necessarily. I'm not suggesting that for one minute, but they're very important to our health is the message I'm trying to get across. And we have access to those. 
Um, also, by stimulating these glands, uh, the pituitary gland is uh, relevant for oxytocin, the love chemical, they call it, you know. Yeah. Uh, we get it when we hug. Um, so we're, we're working on, yeah, secreting those chemicals in a, in a, in a pleasant way, having a bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't want to have to depend on this, and that's exactly where the the release work comes in. That you know, if we can release this tension from the face long term, then we have the right kind of stimulation, if you like, all of the time. Mm. Barring a you know a severe trauma or whatever, we should be in a much better place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the the simple physiology is that we are stimulating these glands and yeah. create these chemicals to make us feel better. Nature's own medicine cabinet. Beautiful. So in an ideal, so I'm going to finish recording this podcast and I'm going to go up into my house and I'm going to hug my wife and smile and <laughs> kiss at the same time. And then I'm going to get serotonin, oxytocin, like a beautiful chemical cocktail, which is going to make me feel good. Yeah. Right. Which you know it will if you do all those things, but we're, we're kind of tricking ourselves by doing this as an exercise as well. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, it's interesting that sometimes the simplest things have, uh, have the biggest effect, but, um, well, it- Sorry, I was going to say, you got me thinking of, funnily enough, the same gentleman that um, is a mutual friend, of, you know, what that man doesn't understand about the human body, I don't know. But um, when he talks about the subtlest of changes, um, you know, when we talk about the, again, the big muscles of the jaw and their relationship with the neck, this actually affects our posture because it affects the relationship of those muscles with the hyoid bone and the atlas vertebrae, and which holds the weight of our head. Mm. So you actually see postural improvements as well. It's yeah, see, there's things I'm missing that are all of these little things that have a huge effect. Um, Can we talk about posture for a minute? Um, just because uh, I, I feel like that's significant here. And does that is that something we can actively? Um, I know I'm, I was recently at a at a workshop and I was getting some instruction about how to kind of screw my feet into the ground and tense my bottom and put my chin back and my chest back and all that kind of stuff. So is that, does that play into what we're talking about? Kind of, but I don't like any of those cues you've been given personally. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, no, I find all of them counterproductive, but hey, you know, like um, I, I'd be a big fan of the guys at Original Strength and places like that. Um, MoveNat, um, Edo Portal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Posture-wise, um, obviously our head is very important. You, you'll see when, when babies develop their movement, a lot of their movement is based around how they carry their head because your head weighs a lot. Mm-hmm. So they carry their head the way it's meant to be. You'll never see them. You know when somebody ducks under a limbo bar, when they do it sideways, for example, when somebody ducks under a bar sideways, you watch most adults do it and they do it with their head down. Your head should be up, but because they can't get their bodies low enough, you know, and that puts massive strain. Most most of us, again, in Western society, through habitual sitting at a computer, sitting too much of the time, we have forward head. So our head's either leaning forward or pushed forward slightly. Mm-hmm. And through the relationship with the big jaw muscles that we're using through doing smiling and also releasing the tension there, but also giving them a workout. So it's kind of this releasing what we don't want and increasing strength where we need it. Yeah, It, it, it interacts with the muscles of the neck to help relax. And also, as I say, that atlas vertebrae and the hyoid bone, which sits in kind of the throat area, it's not connected to any other bone by ligament. It's unique in that, in that way. They act as a spirit level. So if you imagine you're affecting this subtle little thing up here, but this is, this is your spirit level for the rest of your body. And, and myself and others have seen change through this, you know, shoulders that were one, one shoulder that was once lower than the other, coming back in alignment with the other within a month or two. Um, because once you've got your head, you know, Alexander technique, understand this There's so many, the guys at original strength, they're, they're so far ahead, um, in this area that, you know, they're wonderful. They don't go into the neuroscience, even though they understand it because they don't need to. So doing things like head nods, crawling, um, rolling around on the floor, um, Mm -hmm. profound effects, you know, um, you'll see. 76 year olds who can hardly walk spend 20 minutes with those guys and you know they're walking out unaided after one session so yes it's it's subtle things postures postures a huge thing um but it's again it's not something we should we should force it's yeah you know i know a bit about movement but 
I kind of feel inadequate because the people that I've in that field, because the people that I've read are so brilliant um, that I'd recommend people if they want to understand posture, um, then, you know, Steve Maxwell, original strength, you know, yeah. Portal, move now, things like that. That's, that's posture. You're, you're led with your head to a, to a large degree. Um, and your psoas will lead you if you're, if you're going to throw a punch or you're going to run. Um, yeah. Is that uh, something, I mean, uh, we've had, we actually had somebody on the podcast before who is a, a move net specialist. Um, and they were on for the purposes of talking a lot about getting out in nature, grounding, um, you know, natural exercise, um, and all those sorts of things. And as a result of that, I found myself trying to do pull-ups in trees and stuff, which was kind of fun. Um, so yeah, that, that, that resonates a lot. Um, did you want to talk a bit more about the, the psoas? Is that the bit you wanted to go into a bit more? Um, not really, no, to be honest. We, you know, because we covered it all. We don't need to know much more about that. You know, right. we, we go into the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, but we don't need to know much more. We know that they release, they secrete these chemicals. Yeah. We know that DMT, if we have a healthier pineal gland through stimulation, we will, DMT is not just produced in, in the pineal gland, it's also produced in the gut. But if we can secrete more of that, if we can stimulate this gland to become more healthy again, that is generally unhealthy in most of us, we have, yeah, we have a better supply of these chemicals, DMT for processing in dreams. Um, you know, we have better supply of melatonin, serotonin, and we don't really need to know much more. It's, it's yeah. kind of, it's detailed. yeah, you know, yeah, you can know too much sometimes. Um, so what did that, that exercise, the smile and kiss exercise, what did that do for you? And what have you seen it done, do for other people? release um, a huge amount of muscular tension in the face, um, in the jaw and in the front of the mouth. Um, change my perception along with the release because the release makes my face face sit differently every single day. Mm. So that constant drip, drip, drip is a more positive one. Um, it changed my mood. It changed my mood more of the time. And the more I'm approaching life or the more you approach life in that frame of mind the same as if you would taken drugs for it that has a knock-on effect the more time you spend positive the more you see the world positive um mm-hmm. it helped me relax it helped the muscles relax the more the muscles relax it's it's a it's a positive feedback loop yeah. it's, it's, cha- it's changed my life i've gone from being kind of recovering with with just using the the um the neurogenic tremors in the psoas to having better posture, um, to seeing the world differently, completely differently. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I no longer watch any negative media. And even if I do catch some, I don't find it affects me at all. Mm. Um, or yeah, okay. A little bit, but in a more objective way, I don't start worrying. I look at it and think that's bad. And I might go and do something. I might just be triggered to immediately go and give money to a charity that works in that field. I might be triggered to call somebody and say, Hey, if I can help in any way, give me a shout. Um, but I'm not sitting there letting that build up. Yeah. In my mind. Um, which as you so, said before is the, is the cumulative stress over time, which is what's causing the problems. Yeah. When you, when you're given certain news and you're in a different place, you respond to that news differently because your worldview is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, that's what I suppose if I was if I was going to get across one one other thing, um, that would be the utilizing of that little place just on the roof of the mouth, um, kind of between the top of your teeth and the base of your nose. If you just imagine the sensation there, just go to it and kind of go, oh, "Hi, how are you doing?" Um, just pay attention to how that feels without trying to do anything. Um, like put your tongue on it to feel it, or just. No, you no, can put okay. your tongue in it. You can put your tongue in it to know where it is if you want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is no exact spot. The more we just bring our awareness to that rough area. If you imagine the base of your nose, literally where your your nose ends in the middle, in between the two nostrils, and go backwards onto the inside of the roof of your mouth, mm-hmm. and it just just bring an awareness there. Um, if you were to try it now, I don't know if you want to, but if you were to try it now and give it maybe 10, 20 seconds, I think you'd see what would happen. Um, I don't know if you are doing it now because I can't see you, but um, I am. 
feel a softening of the forehead. Has that kicked in yet? Mm-hmm, yeah. 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 So that, that's just a very, very brief, brief time doing that. Um, but if you, if you take yourself there when you're in a quiet place, whether you just sat in a chair or lying in bed um, and play with it, eventually you'll be there for a matter of seconds and it'll be almost as if you've then disappeared inside your own head and your prefrontal cortex is switched off and you're, you're in that place that people aspire to with meditation um, where you're conscious, but you're not thinking you're just there allowing repair to take place. Mm. Uh, yeah. But, so but, are those, yeah, that, the, that the, the smile and kiss and also the roof of the mouth, are those, are those things that you proactively use today for your wellness or do you, are they things that you consciously do as a kind of part of your routine? I'm kind of in a place where I just play with them now and again. I think because things have improved so much for me that I, I no longer set time aside. Um, I think because they're so much fun, particularly because there'll come a point, I should have said actually, when you do the smiling and kissing, there will become a point or that there usually comes a point very, very quickly within a week or two that these, the release mechanism in particular takes on a life of its own. It's as if you've awakened this innate healing mechanism. Mm. So if you need to release, when you find yourself in a relaxed mood, when you're sat down and you relax, whether that's just sat down on the sofa or whether you actually bring your awareness to that place, a release will just happen. Um, you can keep doing them for fun if you enjoy them, you know. Um, but no, I, I find myself going to that place at night sometimes um, just for the fun of it because I love going there because it's it's almost like immediate meditation for me now. I suppose because I've practiced that so much. Um, you can tap into it fairly quickly, yeah. Well, it's just bringing an awareness there. My, my body taps into it. I don't. I'm not skilled. All I'm doing is through practice, my body is obviously... You know, because it's my body that's doing all the work. It's like, I'm, I'm just allowing it to do what it does. I go there and it just switches off, for want of a better explanation, very, very quickly. Mm. Um, if I was to do it now for about 20 seconds, I wouldn't be able to talk to you for about a minute because I'd, I'd then struggle to come back and form enough thoughts of forming words. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it just becomes a fun thing to play with. But I would say at first, yeah, definitely, if you, if you can consistently do the smiling and kissing, um, and, and play with that place in the roof of the mouth. You can do that anytime. You can do that when you sat in the car, go there, you know. You're going reptile. Um, that's what you're doing by doing that. Um, going reptile like that. You're switching off the front brain and, and you're going reptile. Yeah, you know, you can, if you, I have to mention this because there's, there's, a, there's a couple of guys that are cyclists that are using the roof of the mouth thing at the moment. Maybe you shouldn't go reptile if you're driving your car because reptiles <laughs> probably wouldn't be very good in cars, I'm guessing. Well, you, you already do. You see, this is the thing. Like when, how, how many times have you done a two-hour journey and you can't remember more than five or ten minutes of it? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. You've gone reptile. That's what's happened. <laughs> you, you've taken over. Your automatics have taken over. Your, yeah. your reptile will not hurt you. Your reptile will not hurt you in any way. It is there for, to, for your survival, for, you know, to thrive. yeah. Yeah. And it's, this is why the healing takes place. This is why I'm able to access, and other people are, the neurogenic tremors in the psoas, through this place in the mouth because you switch off the front brain to such a point that you're now in the reptile system for, for want of a, you know, and that connection between the reptile brain and the psoas, that's ancient. Mm. So any healing that goes on, bang, you're, you're in healing mode then. Um, yeah, you know, so that, that's what you're doing. You're, you are effectively going reptile and, and the reptile wants you to be well and it will do whatever it has to do to make you well. So do you think it would be beneficial for somebody who's suffering from a panic attack, for instance, to go reptile? I love that term. <laughs> I, I, think, I think if somebody that's suffering a panic attack, I've never had a panic attack. So I, I don't know. I, I believe they can be hugely debilitating. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would imagine if you, I mean, you'd know more than me on that, a lot more. Well, you know a lot more than me on a lot of things. To be fair. <laughs> I don't know much at all. But um if, if somebody is able to take themselves to that place, yes, it would be wonderful for them. Mm. Um, because to tell them to smile and kiss might be too much. You know, that, that's an exercise that we do for a certain purpose. But if you can, yeah, if you can take your, take your attention to that place, if you can bring your awareness, like a soft focus there, as I like to call it, you know, just a, yeah, I, I, I would imagine it could be hugely beneficial. You were just about to say something to do with cyclists and the roof of the mouth. What was that? 
Oh yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple of guys who are um, cyclists and potentially a top swimmer working with this uh, with going reptile because if if you imagine that you take you take the prefrontal cortex element out of sport, it's what people call flow. Yeah, when when athletes are in flow, when fighters yeah. are in flow, they've gone reptile. That's what flow is. And if you... You've stopped thinking and now you're just at reacting. Doing, yeah, yeah, you are doing. The reptile is yeah. doing, you've stopped thinking. So, A, there's the element of the energy that it takes to power all this thought. You know, it's it's exhausting. Mm. You, know? you know that yourself. I mean, you know, I've read your work, you know, you, it's, yeah. And the other element of this is that you are not thinking about what you're doing in, so you're saving energy in that way, but you are just doing. So there's mm. there's no there's no effort. Not only is there no effort going into thinking, your muscles are just doing what they do. Um, it's like it's like entering the zone. It's flow. The, these cyclists are finding they're in flow. They're finding they're becoming more efficient. They're finding that they're expending less energy, so they feel stronger and faster because they're not using something that takes a, a great deal of energy. They're they're entering flow. You know, this thing that's this elusive place for sports people to be, they're entering flow simply by bringing their attention to this place because this place is the meeting of your two energy channels. You're plugging in the final gap um, and making flow easy. Amazing. I, uh, yeah, I, when you said to try it before, I tried it and I found myself like zoning out a little bit. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe that's something I need to, to check out a little bit more. Where, where do these, because I know that you, you're a believer in, in, in meditation as well. So is there, a, is there a place where you can go reptile and meditate and kind of pull all this stuff together in, in a daily practice? When you say a place you can go? Well, you, you know, just in terms of, um, I'm, in a couple of things you mentioned, you've, you've talked about meditation as being a useful, another useful tool to, you know, calm yeah. your mind and, and all those sorts of things. So would you... Are you just generally saying meditation's good, or would you integrate either of these things with that? Integrate the the kissing and smiling, or integrate the attention on the roof of the mouth. Are there either of those the, things so useful? The, sorry, yeah, the, the roof of the mouth is meditation for me. That right. that is um, that in, in many types of meditation, like meditation's kind of lost its way and become very very mind focused in many of the, the so called disciplines out there. You know, to to attainment based to you know, if you don't follow this school and attain this level of this, then you you know you're not a meditator. Um, meditation is allowing healing, allowing the brain to rest, um, zoning out, whatever we want to call it, entering a flow state, and and that's as we've just said. You know, people focus on candles, people focus on a spot of the wall, people focus on a mantra. Some of these can be wonderful. You know, the simple I am mantra and it works wonders for people. Mm. We, we're using this in place of that where, you know, so go to your, your quiet place. Um, you know, you, you can, the great thing I, I like about this is that you can do this quite easily. If you're sat in a room with stuff going on with a loved one, obviously you have to tell them I'm going to do this for the next. Yeah. Um, I'm going to reptile. So don't talk to me. Yeah. I'm going reptile. Love. <laughs> yeah. Leave me alone. Um, yeah, but it, obviously a quiet place is great. You know, when you're in bed at night, if you're in a quiet room, it makes it even easier. But mm. because you are, you, you've had a very brief insight doing it there for a few seconds. When you when you do this and you do it more and more and more, it it, it is meditation for me. Um, and I don't take away from any of the other wonderful things that work at all. But for me now, it's just become the essence of meditation because meditation is the processing of what we need to process but without even having to work at processing it we're we're resting that part of the brain and allowing it to process that without any effort from us we're just turning it off mm. did, did, we, did we get into the brain the brain mapping things in the u.s where they took them out in nature for one night um they rested their prefrontal cortex for one night so they've given them word association tests and they were getting like 40, 50%. They went out in nature for one night, so nothing to stimulate them in that way, nothing to really stimulate the prefrontal cortex. And they went back in after one night out, took the same tests. Well, obviously not the same, very same questions, but um, same standard of test, and they were getting 90 to 
And and that's essentially what meditation for me is about. It's about resting and processing the stuff we need to process. And Mm. in the same way that with the psoas, when you release those that emotional trauma, you almost just see a a brief image and it's gone. It's almost effortless. Um, It's obviously not because you you have to do, you know, to get it to that state. But none of this should be hard. That's the point. You know, I mean, like, we'd have died off a long time ago as a species if, you know, modern life has has caused this. And this is just another way, I believe, a particularly powerful way of stepping into that loop and allowing us to heal um, and to heal long term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think um, with the the attention on the roof of the mouth, with the smile and a kiss, and we've got some, uh, as a result of this interview, this this podcast, we've got some great practical things which people can start using straight away. And I'm going to start using that as a, a meditation pro- practice and I'll feed back and, and let you know how I get on. But um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to share before we kind of wrap up. Not or are we, really, or are we good? The, 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 I don't want. So, I don't want to feel like you have to go into more detail. I think. I think we've got enough. I just wanted to check. There was nothing else you wanted to mention. No, just just thank you very much for the chance to, to kind of spread the word about this, and and I hope that you and anyone that that tries it will will benefit from it. You know, um, remember remember to play. You don't have to keep thinking of the word play, but remember to play, and that it's not serious. We're not trying to achieve anything because that's part of where the magic lies. Your perception of it. Um, mm. Other than that, go go with it, play with it. And, you know, if anybody ever wants to ask me questions, uh, you know, I, I have a, a rubbish website. Um, but you can get me on Facebook or through email, you know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Sounds That's good. It. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Andrew. I really appreciate it. No problem at all, Tim. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers, buddy. Bye-bye. So there you have it. Hopefully now for the rest of today and uh, for the foreseeable future, you will be smiling and kissing more and going reptile in your own time. I am uh, I was going reptile listening to that. Uh, and it feels good to to disconnect a little bit. So try those out and, and send me an email. Let me know what you think. Give me some feedback. Um, speaking of which, if you do want to connect, just go to the contact page on the website, send me an email or use the form, whichever tickles your fancy. I um, respond to all emails. Sometimes it takes me a bit longer than usual uh, if I've got a bit of backlog, but I will get back to you. I do respond to everything. Um, Also, if you would be kind enough to leave us a review, please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to this. Uh, Also on the podcast page on the website, you'll see a link there which takes you straight to the place to do a review. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.